today is June, Monday, June 4th, 2012. We will be discussing Ron Hansen's Exiles. I am Vincent Spadelli. Um, what am I supposed to say? I'm Brian Vargas. I'm Brian Vargas. I'm Jacob Serra. And, and my name is Daniel Perez. We will begin with Jacob and the story of the beginning of the story with Mr. Hopkins. Uh, Mr. Hopkins was born in Stratford, England in 1844. And um, he was a very good poet uh, from the beginning. He liked poetry. He won uh, poetry awards in high school. And he was, because of those awards, because of those awards, he was awarded a scholarship to Oxford, where he went and he attended. And there he met Robert Bridges, uh, we'll talk more about him later. And he discovered at Oxford that um, Christianity was really the theology that he would like to pursue. And he felt that the Anglican Church was simply just a copy without the Holy Spirit. And from there, he went to Ireland. And to talk about uh, Hopkins and the Jesuits, Vincent Spadone. Uh, Hopkins joined, joined uh, the Society of Jesus, and he went to St. Buenos Academy to learn how to become a Jesuit. He's a very rigorous and intense uh, learning facility there. And he was told by the Jesuits that he could not write po his poetry anymore. So he gave his works to Robert Bridges, and after his death, Bridges published his works. Um, also, because he was a Jesuit, his parents, it led to a lot of conflict with his parents because they were Anglican and his parents would not visit him, only on his deathbed they visited him. Very cool. And now I will talk about the darker times in Hopkins' life. Um, there was a time when Hopkins spent his life in Ireland that came to be known as his dark years and this produced a lot of darker poetry the epitome of which is I wake and feel the fell of dark. It was just very dark stuff. And this began when he graduated from Oxford with his, he did uh, graduate, but he did fail his final theology exam. And from there he didn't, he wasn't very happy. And he wrote along with I wake and feel the fell of dark. Those were the times he wrote his, what came to be known as the terrible sonnets which some say contributed to his uh, death of uh, typhoid fever. Let's go to Brian now. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, him writing the Wreck of the Deutschland. Um, he wrote the Wreck of the Deutschland in stages. The first six stanzas he was able to write fairly quickly and fairly easily, but after that he was uh, struggling with writer's block. Um, the book describes a dramatic confession experience where he confesses to God in the church at St. Um It describes him uh, feeling wretched and letting God know and asking for forgiveness for his wretched thoughts. Um, after that, he was able to write the poem fairly easily. Very cool. Um, next, will you film me, please? Just for because I'm first. Next, we'll go over some of the imagery in the story that impacted us. I will begin with. No, I lied. Vincent will begin. Okay. With citing the page number from which he will be reading. Um, my imagery is on page nine. It carries over to page ten. Uh, it reads, but in the, in the darkened chapel, it was so silent, he could hear the faint, sweet sibilance as knuckling flames consumed the wicks of votive candles. Um, it's really, um, I could see and feel the, the chapel, I could, I could hear the sounds that he's describing, and the, I could hear the candles wave and the wicks burn and the silence he says is very uh, rich rich in the and to, um, very good Jacob your turn what imagery impacted you um, the passage that I chose is on page 135 
It's a couple paragraphs down, and it reads, In spite of the, f of the howling storm, more passengers were rushing out to the iron lifeboats with hopes of escape. Then, scurrying in retreat from the cannon noise and icy spray of wave explosions that were as high and wide as the white oak trees, the sea in its fury yanked another iron boat off its davits as Brigenstein went outside, held an American megaphone to his mouth, and shouted, Stop with the lifeboats, the sea won't let us. I could really just feel like the icy water is washing over and you could see all the people just rushing to the lifeboats and the captain coming out just saying, no, there's no time, just get out of the water. Very good. Thank you. Brian? Uh, I'm going to be talking about page 182. Another man took off his striped tie and hanged himself from a hoist of the pilot house and was not noticed until his purple cheek mashed up against the aft window glass. A child was lost at sea, and in order to join him in her death, in his death, his grieving mother sliced the veins of her wrists with a penknife. The stewardess who convinced Waldheim not to commit suicide was headed to the pilot house with an urn of coffee when she slipped on the ice water the ice of the weather deck and was purchased by a torrent of white seething foam and never seen again okay first off we can we can almost see and feel the foam and the, the waves that are taking this uh, poor woman to her death. But besides that is we can feel the pain of the people who are dying. Feel the fear of the man who hangs himself instead of drowning, which is uh, described as the worst possible death that you can imagine. And we can feel the mother slicing her veins, and instead of feeling pain, feeling relief knowing that she'll be with her child. Thank you for that. Um, my passage comes from page 189. Um, this is in the middle of the storm that wrecks the ship. At three in the morning, the increasing north winds lowered the temperature to the dangerous, cruel, raw bitterness of winter. And toes and noses became frostbitten. Even gloved hands lost their grip. And an, exa an exhausted Siegfried Benning could hang on no longer and skidded down into Anna Petzl and then flailed everywhere for a handful in his long fall until he hit the sea face first. So at three in the morning, the storm has been going on for quite some time now and people are taking a toll. And just the, the freezing temperature, it's really frightening to me because when it's so cold and you're so tired that you can't even hang on anymore and you just fall taking this woman, Anna, with him, it's quite terrifying for me to imagine. Okay. Oh yeah, now we'll go, we'll go over some stanzas found at the end of Exiles. Uh, we'll begin with Brian. Yeah. What stanza are you going to talk about, Brian? Do stanza one. Uh, in the first, I should probably read the stanza. Go for it. Thou mastering me, God, giver of breath and bread, world strand, sway of the sea, lord of living and dead, thou hast bound bones and veins in the fastening of flesh, and after it almost unmade with the dread, thy doing, and thou... thou Dost thou touch me afresh? Over again I feel thy finger and find thee. So in stanza one we uh, hear Hopkins acknowledging the fact that God literally made him from nothing. I mean, you can f you can almost see God taking a piece of flesh and putting veins in it and making this Hopkins, you know, filled with bones and just things that make up the human. And uh, in other words, Hopkins literally owes God everything because everything that he is, God made. Um, it's powerful. It's a very powerful stanza because he puts himself in such a vulnerable state, saying literally that God, like he would be nothing without God. Thank you. Uh, Jacob, which one are you going to read us? I will be uh, reviewing and reading Stanza 5. Uh, I kiss my hand to the stars, lovely asunder, starlight wafting him out of it, and glow, glory, and thunder. Kiss my hand to the dappled with damps in west, since though he is under the world's splendor and wonder, his mystery must be in trust, stressed, for I greet him the days I meet him, and bless when I understand. 
Uh, the stanza is very Jesuit in the first couple of lines, where he kisses his hand to the stars and kisses his hand to the west, and then he recognizes that God is in the wonder and the splendor, which he sees. It's very Jesuit. God is in all things. And he says his mystery must be interest and stress. So he's saying we need to see God and know God in all things. Understand. And the last line, for I greet him the days I meet him and bless when I understand. He will go to God eventually, he knows that, and he will be grateful and know that he understands and be grateful that he understands. Very cool. Thank you. Who's trade? Um, I will be reading sonnet number 14. Stanza. Stanza. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, she drove in the dark to leeward. She struck not a reef or a rock, but the combs of a smother of sand. Night drew her dead to the Kentish knock, and she beat the bank down with her bows and the ride of her keel. The breakers rolled on her beam with ruinous shock, and canvas and compass, the whirl and the wheel, idle forever to waft her or wind her with, these she endured. So we're talking about uh, here the, the ship itself, and it's quite common to use, uh, to personify a ship with she we, we, or her, that's not unusual, but the other personifications of the ship, the saying that she, that she had to endure the struggles of this storm, talking about the ship crashing off the shore of Kent, idle forever to waft or wind her with, these she endured. So it's saying that it's, it's like trying to get to a deeper meaning with the suffering that if this ship suffered this much, imagine the passengers on the ship. Imagine the what they felt on the ship. And then the usual uh, night and darkness, mention of the dark night and the combs of sand being lost into that. It's just really an expression of how Mother Nature can influence something like that. I will be discussing stanza 17. They fought with God's cold, and they could not, and fell to the deck, crushed them, or water, and drowned them, or rolled with the sea romp over the wreck. Night roared, but the heartbreak, hearing a heart broke rabble, the woman's wailing, the crying of a child without check, till a lioness arose breasting the babble. A, prof a prophetess towered in the tumult, a virginal tongue told. So we're talking about the horrors of the night here and the passengers, what they feel and what they're experiencing. The passengers cling to like the rigging and as they fall, when they lose their grip, they either are crushed by the fall or they're knocked over by some waves and uh, drowned. And the women, you can hear the women's wailing and the child, um, their, their shrieks. It overpowers the sound of, of the waves. And everything seems like out of control. But then um, a woman comes, a lioness, he describes her as, is, which is probably one of the five nuns that he um, is so impacted by. And she... He, he uses this image to uh, picture her as like a, 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 a powerful woman and someone who could speak words from God into the situation and know that like God is God is with them in this stanza. Very cool. Thank you, Vincent. And that's all for us for Ron Hansen's Exiles. Thank you very much.